Good evening. I'm so pleased that you can join us all here this evening. I'm Karen Taylor, Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. Uh, this is our second uh, fall uh, 2020 landmark lecture, and we will have uh, our third landmark lecture next week. We're very pleased to be able to present this series of lectures with the New York Landmarks Conservancy, and I want to express our appreciation for their help and support. For those of you who might be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York was founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of the City of New York. Today, our 235-year-old organization uh, continues to serve the people of the City of New York through our educational uh, and cultural programs. These include our tuition-free Mechanics Institute, um, our John M. Mossman Locke Museum, our General Society Library, which is going to be celebrating 200 years in November. And finally, this lecture, our lecture series. It was first started in 1837. So this, we're very pleased to have another wonderful lecture to add to this tradition. Um, now, during the lecture, there'll be an opportunity to submit typewritten questions through the Q&A section. Uh, at the end of the talk, we'll answer as many of these questions as we can in our short Q&A session. But just to let you know in advance that we may not be able to answer them all. Our talk tonight was postponed from March 17th. And it's such a great pleasure for us that we've been able to rearrange it and highlight the wonderful work of Spirit Ironworks and in particular their project at Henry Street Settlement. As part, as part of tonight's talk, we also have spe several special guests joining us. To introduce our speaker this evening, I'm very pleased to introduce the curator for the series, Lisa Easton, a partner in the New York City-based architecture and historic preservation firm, Easton Architects. Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, I wish it were live and in person, but this is uh, the next best thing. So I hope you enjoy the lecture tonight. I certainly will. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little brief introduction and then introduce Rachel and her brother, Tim, who will be presenting tonight. Preservation provides us with tangible objects that provide identity, memory, and continuity to ourselves, our communities, and our personal history. It helps root us in our heritage it develops unity and provides a spirit that helps define a neighborhood, a community, a city. It establishes a timeline and it provides answers to the questions of time and place, rise and fall, riches and neglect. Preservation is not about being nostalgic. It is about living in a better present. That we are a part of and a broader reach that connects eras, creates continuity and embraces a more cumulative whole. And this is as important as the physical landmarks that represent our past and provide the foundation for our future. I'm honored to be a part of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen 2020 Labor, Literature, and Landmarks Lecture Series. And when asked to curate the four-part series, I wanted to bring together a group of individuals whose experience captures the essence of preserving our treasured landmarks from technology of materials and methodology to advocacy and historic research. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce our third lecturer in this year's series, Rachel Miller. Rachel is an artist, craftsman, and blacksmith. She is co-owner along with her brother, Tim, of Spirit Ironworks. Rachel received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Sculpture from the University of Arts in Philadelphia and went on to apprentice with some of the great master smiths including Frank Turley, Peter Rose, and Tom Joyce. Tim Miller, Rachel's brother and business partner, received his BFA in metalsmithing from SUNY New Paltz. He is a master smith and toolmaker, having studied under great blacksmiths, including Noel Putnam and Jay Close. He has taught toolmaking at Peters Valley School of Craft in Layton, New York, 
the Brookfield Center for Craft in Brookfield, Connecticut, and in their own shop at Spirit Ironworks, located in Bayport, New York. Together, Rachel and Tim have worked on a variety of commissions, including the Jeff Kuhn Civil War Mortar Sculpture, which is an historically faithful recreation of the Dictator Mortar, as well as the sculpture replicating the Liberty Bell, hand rope stanchions for the Brooklyn Bridge, and many local restoration projects, including the Lakeview Cemetery Gates in Patchogue, New York, and historic hardware for the Long Island Maritime Museum, among many of their accomplishments. Together, Rachel and Tim have executed a wide variety of projects from private commissions to authentic restorations and replications and have exhibited their sculptures locally and nationally. Rachel and Tim epitomize the General Society's motto, by hammer in hand, all arts do stand. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Rachel Miller and Tim Miller. Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Miller and I am one of the owners of Spirit Ironworks. We are blacksmiths and one of our specialties is historical restoration. Every once in a while, we have an opportunity to work on a project that has a higher purpose and engages us on many levels. This project was one of those. I am happy to be able to share with you tonight the story of a wonderful project we were involved in for the Henry Street Settlement on the Lower East Side in New York City. In 2018, we were asked by Lee Salzman Architects and the Henry Street Settlement to restore almost two, two centuries old ironwork located in the front of three of the settlement's buildings. First, a little bit about the history of Henry Street. Henry Street Settlement is a home to a not-for-profit social service located in the Lower East Side neighborhood of Manhattan that provides social services, arts programs, and healthcare services to New Yorkers of all ages. Founded in 1893 by a young visiting nurse named Lillian Wald, it is considered to be many, by many to be the birthplace of the social welfare reform movement. Over the years, the settlement occupied several buildings in the area, including 263, 265, and 267 Henry Street. Now I would like to introduce David Gardza, the president and CEO of Henry Street Settlement. David has been president since 2010. He joined Henry Street's workforce development in 2001 and became their chief administrator in 2005. He is going to say a few words about what this work means to their organization and how they are proud stewards of their buildings and all the history that carry forward into the present day. And it'd also be lovely to hear just a little bit about the work that Henry Street Settlement does for our community. So I'm gonna turn it over to David. It's an honor and a privilege to be with all of you tonight uh, celebrating this really important and meaningful project uh, to the settlement. Uh, I want to thank everyone at Spirit Ironworks, uh, including Rachel, Tim, and Lisa. I, I want to thank uh, everyone at Lee Salzman. I want to thank everyone at the New York City Landmarks Commission. I want to thank everyone at the State uh, Landmarks Commission. And I want to thank everyone at Henry Street Settlement, including our board of directors, uh, and particularly Renee Epps and Maggie Oldfather, who stewarded and shepherded and cared for this project at, at every step of the way. And, you know, to begin, I, I think it's really important to note that because of where this project sits at the heart of our historic headquarters, um, right smack in the middle of our 18 sites, uh, at the heart of the settlement, just about everyone who works at Henry Street got to be, uh, a, got a little taste of this project because as we came and went for the duration of the project, we got to experience and witness the care and love and stewardship and responsibility that went into restoring and preserving the facade of our building and all of that, that beautiful uh, ironwork. And I, I will say what we've been saying at Henry Street since we celebrated our 125th, uh, our Quas Quicentennial uh, about two years ago, is that we embrace our history to shine a light on our future. And I don't think that that is anywhere more relevant than the project that we are here to celebrate today in the ironwork. Um, Henry Street has been exceptionally busy in the present day um, to the point where I would argue that it's as busy as it's been in its entire 127 year history. But we couldn't be as busy as we are and we couldn't be in as intense response to the community if we didn't have a blueprint that was laid out 
in our founding days by our founder, Lillian Wald, who was mentioned in the introduction. Lillian Wald was a 26-year-old nurse when she founded Henry Street, and it was on a very, very simple premise, in times of need, act. And that has characterized and served as our blueprint for the entire time that we've been functioning and thriving as a human service organization. And that blueprint, in, implicit in that blueprint, is the notion of neighbor helping neighbor. And when the neighborhood experience a crisis, and we're one of the few organizations that can say in New York City that we, this is not our first pandemic, but every single point of crisis uh, throughout our history, not only was Henry Street present, but that cast iron was present. So if you look at the Spanish flu, if you look at before that World War I, if you look at the Great Depression, if you look at World War II, if you look at the civil rights movement in the 60s, urban blight in the 70s, AIDS and crack in the 80s. Sorry, sorry, that's my wife calling me. I have to um, silence that for a second, but uh, I'll make sure she's okay. Sorry about that. Um, through Hurricane Sandy, through 9-11, through the present day crisis, um, I'm so sorry. There we go, that should do it. Um, the settlement has been present and it's important that in response to neighbor helping neighbor, that we have, the, the community expects, expects us to be present, expects us, expects us to be strong, expects us to be agile and expects us to be responsive to the needs that emerge. And in doing so, our stewardship of all of the characteristics and all of the architectural details and all of the elements of our building is a big part of that because it is our home base. We consider it um, uh, our epicenter and it's critically important for us to be strong so that we can bear the weight of this moment and any moment. And so that's why we wrap our heads and our hearts around uh, projects like this because it represents an investment in our history and in our present and in our future. And I, I will also say that in response to COVID, Henry Street Settlement has been acutely active. To date, we've delivered 400,000 meals to people who are facing food insecurity. We've distributed $300,000 in emergency cash assistance. We have gotten over 400 people back to work at different types of employment opportunities. We fielded a thousand calls to our helpline that we put up as an alternative to the 311 service because many can't navigate it. We've placed over 7,000 calls to our seniors who are vulnerable. We've redeployed nurses and delivered food to our homeless shelters. And all across the spectrum of sites that Henry Street operates, uh, we've been active in response to neighbor helping neighbor. And it all stems back to that blueprint statement in times of need act that simply would not be possible if we didn't have the strong infrastructure and the investment in our history and the strong foundation that's reflected in the bricks of our building and that's reflected in the cast iron of our building and that's reflected in the heart of the settlement. So I'm really delighted to be here tonight um, and it's particularly important that this particular project puts such a shining face forward on one of our 18 sites from where we serve over 50,000 New Yorkers every year. So thank you for everyone who helped make the project possible and Thank you for the investment in our present, in our future, and in our community. We're very grateful and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I'm hoping everybody can see my screen here now. Um, and I'd like to proceed with the lecture and I'm really happy to hear all the fine work that's been going on since the um, pandemic and all through the years. And we are really honored to be part of this process in whatever little way we can contribute. So moving on with the lecture, I would like to talk a little bit about the history of the structures um, over at 263, 265, and 267 Henry Street. Um, 263 and 265, which are over here, I'm just gonna set up my laser pointer, are the first two buildings on the left. Um, they were federal style row homes that were built in the late 1820s to early 1930s. To date, their original architects remain unknown. 267 over here, Henry Street was built in 1834 and is a three-story townhouse. It's a fine example of a Georgian eclectic style home. Initially, these structures served as private homes for the well-to-do merchant class and their families. The ironwork on the front of their buildings reflects their 
their wealth and status in society. But by the mid 19th century, most of these um, wealthy residents moved out of the Lower East Side and they were turned into tenement buildings, these homes, to house the growing immigrant population. By 1966, New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission had deemed all three of these buildings as historic landmarks. Now, I love this picture here. This is a photo from the 1920s um, and that represents um, life from time past. We used it as a reference because part of our job as, um, as skilled artisans is to use bits and pieces of the history like this photo to guide us in our processes. The majority of these techniques we use were the same that were originally used to construct the ironwork. So we had to reach deep back into history and let it be our teacher. So this photo from 1938 shows a little bit of the fencing at 265. You can see it here next to this absolutely adorable little boy that was included in our restoration. Now, I know David touched upon the funding, so I don't really need to go into it too much, but I just wanted to mention that it was funded by grants from the New York City Landmarks Conservancy and the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission with the assistance of Lee Salzman Architects and Judith Salzman. Um, many thanks again to all the wonderful parties that made this project possible. So before getting into the actual restoration, I thought it would be interesting to review some of the challenges in restoring historic ironwork. It's not always obvious to related design and construction professionals because modern metalwork is often assembled using different methods and materials that don't translate it well into older work. So a major challenge in undertaking this kind of work is balancing the budget with the desire to faithfully restore the ironwork using the same techniques and the same materials as in the past. Frequently, um, it is preferred to reuse as much of the original material as possible. However, that's not always achievable. In this picture, you can see the conditions of the castings um, it, that are really um, beyond repair. And that's due to the fact there were too many missing or broken off pieces. Many of the castings were missing over 50% of their original material. So after much discussion, it was decided to create a pattern for the new castings by combining pieces from multiple castings, then using the pattern to cast new panels. The other option to piece together old and new material would have been extremely labor intensive and produce an inferior product. It would have resulted in castings that were mismatched in size and weak. Another issue that occurs is lack of skilled artisans to actually perform the work. Um, to recreate and restore metalwork of this quality and time period, the level of skill required is hard to find due to lack of knowledge and training. And some of these lost skills include blacksmithing, tool and die making, hand fitting, filing, forge brazing, and forge welding, as well as many others. Another thing that happens is we have to oftentimes recreate missing components. They have to be made by hand, requiring hours of labor and a great deal of skill, as none of these parts are readily available. They're not available via a catalog, obviously. The skills required take years to perfect using tools that are not always readily available. Sometimes, and a lot of times, we end up making our own tools. Another, uh, another thing that we run into is sometimes the extent of damage or detail is not evident until after the paint is removed. As you can see on the photo on the left, each empty hole represents a missing part. There's corrosion on some of the material that far exceeds what we originally thought. The corner bars, which you can see over here, um, they reveal complex assembly methods such as multiple joints that pass through each other. Some of these issues were quite a surprise and unanticipated, thus requiring a change in how we restored these columns. Another thing that happens is sometimes beautiful details on these posts emerge after paint is removed. Um, I was just going to bring Timothy in for a minute to speak about some of the unique historical details. He's going to take the screen. Hello, everyone. Um, so some of the, uh, the details on these posts that surprised us were, for example, this uh, acorn finial. Um, there was uh, detail chiseled into the top of the finial, as well as decorative beads. 
um, these spindles here with the, um, the center section, you can see the seam right here. This was actually a collar of metal that was heated up and wrapped around the bar and uh, forge welded to the bar. Uh, we also have these decorative urns here and here. And interestingly enough, on uh, each uh, newel post, there were two different sizes. So uh, that led to a little bit of confusion. Uh, <clears throat> and then on the left here, we see there's a brass or bronze rosette. Uh, the scroll work is riveted in place. Uh, we have uh, re later repairs where somebody used a, uh, a nut and a screw to hold it together. Uh, so there was a lot more going on there than uh, what we in initially thought. Thank you, Tim, for for telling us a little bit more about these details. It, they really have quite a, a lot of wonderful craftsmanship involved just in these individual pieces. So another issue that we get into is complex joinery methods. So these images illustrate some of the complex joinery that is involved in the project. This includes mortise and tenon joinery and the extensive use of pins and screws, some of it very elaborate. And because of this joinery, if a piece needed to be replaced, it required disassembling a larger portion of the ironwork because everything was interconnected, sometimes at adding hours of unanticipated work. Now I'd like to talk about the process of the restoration and the various steps that were involved. So first, what we did is we performed a site survey. So the first step was to travel to Henry Street and carefully inspect the almost two centuries old ironwork. The physical assessment included photographing the site conditions with the original ironwork in place. We then compared our site photos with the historical images of the ironwork so we can determine what restoration and repairs were needed. The initial survey was done by Lee Salsman, as you can see here, this is one of their drawings. Um, and they also show the original conditions and proposed repairs as well as historic photos. And I've also attached, just for your interest, uh, some of the photos we took to assess the damage. You can see up here that we have some damage missing in cast cap molding, very few pieces left. No cast panel had any of its parts intact. You, here's a photo of, highly of the highly detailed post. You can see the original condition. You can see up here that the original finials and scroll work were missing, that the hand forged scrolls were made from genuine wrought iron as, a, as, as well as a lot of the other scroll work. Um, the decorative floral motif railing inserts were made from cast iron. And this was at 265 Henry Street. Here is also an example of what years of exposure does to the metalwork. Water became trapped between these two pieces on the top, causing them to corrode and buckle. At this point, they are beyond repair. This I included because it's very interesting. It appears that um, due to some of the damage in this ironwork, that it appears to be sat on. Um, the adjacent building next to this fencing was a firehouse. So it is believed that maybe the fireman on duty may have sat on top of the railing. And this is the reason that the bar is bent and the spikes had been removed, because you can see the top railings missing the spikes. There are also lots of missing castings and other forged components. And you can also see the bent scroll work, which may have been um, used as a footrest. And here um, in this image, Mismatched fencing pickets were added later. So there's like three different kinds of finials or no finials on some. There's poorly executed repairs and add-ons. And there's modifications to the original railing, which I'm sure we can all agree were not the most graceful ones. Here is a close up, an example of a badly damaged hand forged finial made from wrought iron. We had to, uh, we had to create several of these for the project. So the next step was to generate shop drawings for, for the preservation architect and the New York Landmarks Preservation Commission for review and approval. So here's just a sample of one of our drawings. In this drawing, the a photo of the damaged railing is, is um, added. 
an elevation of the intended restoration plan was created and reference photos um, included. And then in the second drawing, um, this is of the newel post. And it's with the damage assessed, detailing what needs to be replaced and restored, which is always important to include the scope of the restoration. Um, they, these posts were quite elaborate with lots of missing parts and complex joinery requiring hours of work. And then there's a section of uh, details of the adjacent fencing. I apologize for the phone. This is unanticipated. So the next step was to remove and catalog the ironwork. First, we re after the site survey, the next step was to remove the ironwork and carefully catalog all the individual pieces and how they fit together. Now, here's a snapshot of some of the ironwork with tags, um, and we kept a very detailed list of location um, and what they were part of. Now, this ensures that all the loose components go back to their original spots. Due to the handmade nature of all the parts, similar elements may not be interchangeable. Um, ironwork of this kind is like fitting together pieces of the puzzle. Each piece is unique. After many layers of paint are removed, you can see in this photo before and after paint removal, the good, the bad, and the ugly all become obvious. In this instance, this piece was in pretty nice condition. You're actually surprised. Now, during our assessment, we examined the ironwork and we observed that it was made from a mixture of genuine wrought iron and cast iron. We also discovered more information about the various techniques used during assembly. Now, one of the materials used was genuine um, wrought iron. All the forged pieces and frames on this project were made from it. This is a different uh, material than what is used today. The term wrought iron is used loosely to indicate any kind of steel uh, used in ornamental ironwork. Genuine wrought iron was, the for, was a forgeable ferrous material that was made until about the mid 20th century. It has been replaced by mild modern steel. Um, it is originally called wrought because it, it distinguishes itself from cast or poured iron um, because its manufacture required extensive forming. Sourcing original wrought iron can be challenging as it is no longer commercially manufactured which means we had to use a lot of reclaimed material for this project. Here the photo shows an anchor made from genuine wrought iron. You can see the fiber, it illustrates the fibrous nature of the material, it looks like, appears to have a grain like wood. And since most of the material is reclaimed, we had, um, we had to use a lot of, um, we had to sort, sourcing the material was quite difficult. And moving on to the next slide, uh, you can see here that this is how the genuine wrought iron started out as a, as a square, and we actually forged it into long flat bar for the correct profile, size, and thickness um, for the scroll work. So there's a fair amount of work that just went into preparing the historic material. Now I thought since the since the um, the ironwork has several different methods used. We have forged metalwork and we have cast castings, cast iron. I thought it would be important to illustrate the difference between casting versus forging. When the metal is cast, the material is heated above its melting temperature and poured into the mold to solidify. You can see some molten metal being poured into a mold in this photo. Now cast iron has a relatively low melting temperature and tends to be brittle which could be part of the reason that there were so many castings that had broken or missing pieces on the fencing. When the metal is forged, it's heating, heated to below its melting temperature and manipulated into shape using hammers and other tools. Most of the material forged was genuine wrought iron. And here is a photo of Tim at the coal forge using many of the same tools that were used back then. I thought that would be helpful to include a lot of these tools are made by hand for the Smith for specific jobs. Now I was gonna bring Tim back in just to talk about um, some pre-Civil War metalworking techniques 
as the Henry Street Ironwork is a good example of federal style ironwork constru constructed in the 1830s and employs many of these techniques. Here's the um, so uh, the metal workers of the time only had access to uh, a few primitive machines, uh, probably uh, some form of drilling machine, maybe even not as complex as the one in the painting that we're showing. Um, they may have had a simple lathe. Uh, they had uh, obviously a blacksmith's forge and an anvil, uh, but today um, craftsmen would have welding machines, powered grinders, powered saws. Um, it's quite likely they might have been drilling holes by hand and sawing material by hand. Uh, the quality of the wrought iron that was available to, available to them varied significantly. Um, some wrought iron was very easy to forge and work hot. Some wrought iron uh, would crumble when it was heated. Uh, so they would have to adapt their technique to work with the material that was available. And we saw that reflected in the ironwork on site. Um, sometimes there were joints done that seemed unnecessarily labor intensive when they could have simply forged it. Um, but when working with the material, we found that it wasn't that forgeable. Uh, so they did things like cutting and pinning. Um, and then uh, during this period, ironwork relied upon the skill of individual craftsmen as mass production was still in its infancy. Uh, once again, they had only the most basic machines. Uh, they might have had, uh, you know, the, the iron mills had powered machinery, but the small shops doing ornamental ironwork probably had very, very little, if any, power available to them. So they were still relying upon mostly handwork. Thank you, Tim. I thought that was good to give a background and a context for why certain techniques were used. So now we go into the restoration of um, the 263 Henry Street flower railing. And I call that flower railing because of these cast iron panels. So as I had described before, it was quite a challenge because it required almost complete replacement. Actually, it did require complete replacement because every casting had missing sections. The original frame was also badly warped and very thin. It was due to the fact that the masonry had shifted around and moved over the years and bent and buckled. So you can see the, you can also see the various repairs, the straps and braces holding the railing together. So as I touched upon earlier, a pattern had to be created to replicate the original components. So pattern making is an original casting, which um, was made from individual pieces of, of the original castings. Um, is taken and then made into a pattern by a skilled pattern maker. And they're equally as skilled in a different way as the blacksmith. And to find a good pattern maker is extremely difficult. Um, the size of the pattern will take into account that the castings will shrink after the cast iron pools. The picture on the left are the new castings. I thought this was fun to add in because this is actually us using a modern process. Um, we probably shouldn't out ourselves in that, but the castings had uneven edges. So we used modern machinery methods that, and so that they could be trimmed to a precise size to fit into our new frame. So the image on the right shows the castings being attached by pinning the material to a modern day stainless steel frame. Um, that choice was to prevent rust from forming between the castings and the frame. Notice the special setup used to access the tight space where the pins are located. Now here are the castings in the new frame. Um, it's all ready for the cast loafer rail to be added. Um, it was only available in short sections due to shrinkage and warpage issues that occurred during the castings, during the casting process. So now we get into some restoration highlights of 263 and 265 Henry Street. They had, both of them had beautiful new posts and stoop railings in need of restoration. Now, since there are a lot of small ornate missing pieces in the Henry Street railings, one of the methods utilized to replicate them was to make a die or a swage, either double or single sided, to replicate the missing components such as cap molding, small urns, and acorns. 
In this photo, you will see the various swages used and example of what each tool produced. So you can see them here. These are double-sided and these are single-sided. And we're gonna get into a little bit more of this process because to me, it's truly a fascinating one. So the first step to creating the tool is follows. First, a master is created by turning it on the lathe since it is in the round. And at this point, I'm sure you're probably wondering, why wouldn't we just make all the round components in the lathe and skip making a tool? But making a swage enables us to produce the part over and over again in a similar method as the original much more efficiently. Now then the master is fit between two hot blocks of steel to create the reverse impression. impression. Um, then the tooling needs to be relieved of any sharp edges, which you can see here. Here is the final product after the round bar is struck between the two dies shown on the left. So here's the dies and here's the product. Notice the size of the original material at the bottom. Shows you what we started with. So here's just some more snapshots from the process. On the left, the photo shows the master created from the original. The center photo shows one side of the tool and the master. And on the right is the finished project straight from the forge. Here are the stages from left to right, original, master, and then here is a piece that is preformed. Um, notice the piece on the left with the little piece of metal at the top. Since we're starting with a round bar and the urn narrows in diameter, the top, the material had to go somewhere and that's trimmed off later. So here's an example of a double-sided die. The cap molding originally was made from two pieces. Um, over the years, water got in between, so it was decided to recreate the original profile in one piece. So we created the profile, designed a swage for it, and here is the end result of the new cap. Now we're going into a little bit about the Newell Post restoration. They were extremely complex with lots of details. So for this reason, detailed notes were taken on the top portion of the post before they were disassembled. The details included scrolls with chiseled inlaid lines, a central acorn finial, a pineapple casting, and various decorative urns and balls, all pinned and riveted together. The center collar where the scrolls is joined required a custom tool to replicate. Here's a photo of um, some scrolls made from the reclaimed wrought iron. Um, and as you saw before, the material was forged into the basic shape and then was um, hammered into this scroll to match an existing one that was already there. So in this photo, we're fitting the main scrolls around the central um, pineapple finial. And you can see there are some lovely chiseled details that we put in and the ends are shaped like fans, which we call fishtail scrolls. Now here's an anatomy of what, excuse me, of one of the joints of the newel post. In the side-by-side -side photo, you can see how one of the joints was constructed. One side has a round tenon, which is shown at the left here, and the other side has a shoulder bar um, with a hole drilled in it. So the photo on the right shows the joint partially assembled. And just to give you an idea, it took seven individual operations to replicate this joint. I think this is a really good example of how complex some of the parts were. Nowadays, the parts would simply be welded together and ground smooth, saving much labor. So now I'm gonna bring Tim back in to tell a little story about this gate um, that we restored. So Tim, here, here it comes. So um, I looked at this gate and I sort of smile because uh, it, it has a little secret that nobody knows. Um, so I took the, uh, when I disassembled the gate, it was determined this bar here was really badly corroded. Um, it had pock marks in it that were more than half the thickness. So I had to uh, reproduce it. So here side by side, I have the original and the bar that I reproduced. Um, and you can see I had a special tool to punch out the holes. Um, but when I went and I put it back together, no matter what I did, I kept on shuffling the pickets around, I couldn't get it to go back square. And I was scratching my head, scratching my head, thinking we forgot to catalog something correctly. 
And then I went and I looked at photographs of the site and I realized that the, uh, the steps that this gate was over were not uh, straight or level at all. And the gate had been built to fit that um, quirky little space. So, um, but I also knew that the masonry contractors would come back and make that all square and level and perfect. So we didn't want to put back a, a wonky gate in, in place. Uh, so I had to extend the bottom of each of these pickets a little bit. Each one was a little bit longer to accommodate for the, the slope that uh, was there. So now the gate is all square and perfect, but uh, a lot of older work just is, is simply not uh, square or straight or level. Thank you, Sam. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide. So in this one, we discovered that after paint removal, we were surprised to learn that each fencing picket on the 265 fencing was originally surrounded by lead packing to hold it in place. In the photo on the right, one of our artisans is using a flat punch to pack in lead and secure the picket in place. This is an example of the kind of techniques that were ne necessary before modern welding was available. The bottom of the pickets are riveting in place just like the gate on the earlier slide. This is not the first time restoring old ironwork has taught us a trick or two. Now you can see a photo of one of the completed fencing sections. Um, it was sent to illustrate what was original material and what was new material. So you can see our, our labels there cataloging that. Now I get into um, restoring the 267 Henry Street fencing. And here is a few snapshots cataloging the restoration of the original loafer railings at 267. It was an involved process. The missing top bar was remade as shown up here on the upper um, right hand side. Um, it was used, um, made from reclaimed wrought iron and forged and hammered to match the style and dimension of the existing pieces. The uh, missing spikes were made as well. You can see the various stages in the center. Um, now there's a picture over here showing the blacksmith cutting and making the spikes. Um, and once made, each spike was passed through these square holes and riveted over. Um, and this method of recreation was very much in line with the original method of construction during the 1830s. And here, this is forging a gate latch. The bar is split here, it's opened up and then it's welded onto itself. So it's welded in the fire using a process called forge welding. Nowadays, to be frank, it would be water jet or plasma cut from plate. And here is um, a few photos of this multi-step process in making the floor de lis. Um, you can see that there's the forged material. Here's the three pieces. The pieces are individually made and then forged welded together. You can see one, two, three here becomes one. And um, then it is tenoned. You can see in this picture up here where it's orange, there's a little tenon there and this will get inserted through the bottom of the fencing. Now here we're riveting in replacement circles. You can see the tight space that we're getting into. Um, so we had to use a special uh, tool to do so. Here we are setting the collars around the floor de lis after riveting them in, as you can see at the bottom here. And the collars were um, generally used to um, join things together, and some of them can be quite decorative. This one is actually very simple. And here is the restored fencing panel. We still have to rivet on the top here, um, but you can see it's, it's definitely in a lot better shape than it was originally. So now everything's ready for installation. I just included a few photos here of um, what we were doing. Henry Street also replaced some masonry and reset some masonry because that was also in poor condition in certain areas. And here are some completed photos of the newel posts with the pineapple finials, um, everything restored. You can see the, um, the railings here with the new cap molding. Um, fresh paint. 
And over here is the fencing restored, new masonry as well, new finials, a gate with a new gate latch that is now square. And here is the cast iron railings with the new frame, the new castings and the low for rail, and even a gate was added at this point. And here is the stoop railing at 265, the front view with the restored newel posts. I think the job in total took almost a thousand hours. And now I would like to introduce Judith Salsman, um, who's a pr the pr principal of Lee Salsman Architects, who is a key part of making this restoration happen. And I would like to invite her to speak a little bit about the history of the project. Well, th thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Rachel and Tim, for a really exceptional um, insider's view. Um, even for those of us who worked on the project, uh, this presentation uh, brought detail and depth to the, the complexity that I think is really a privilege for all of us to see, and, and thank you, you know, really for sharing that. Um, this is a project that involved, you know, an exceptional client, um, someone a group that wants to do good in the world and specifically at, in the Lower East Side and has been um, for, since the 1890s. Um, an exceptional contractor, as you can see, whose passion and knowledge um, was really um, made this, made this an, an experience that all of us, um, um, I just lost my image, that all of us learned so much. And there was a sense of excitement. They would say, oh, we took the paint off and we discovered on the underside of the pineapple, there's an acorn. And you know, there was just a constant ongoing and many thanks also to Indisexer in our office who was the project manager. And, and also for the involvement of the city and, and the New York Landmarks Conservancy. So the commission and the conservancy both of whom assisted by giving grants so the proper level of restoration and preservation could be part of this incredible project for Henry Street settlement. And so it really was a perfect storm in, this, in, the, in the positive sense of bringing all those pieces together so that we really created something here, restored something with, with all its history and its mix, as you know, um, the 1827 and 1834 buildings were altered many times, but the buildings were restored in, in uh, 1964 and designated um, by the Landmarks Commission, one of their earliest acts in 1966, stating that they chose to restore their buildings and continue to use them rather than rather than raising them. And that's actually in the designation report. And so I think the continuity of the, the, the respect for the history, the, the level of stewardship, the intent to do um, fine preservation work within the context of the greater city. And it, really all these pieces came together and I found it a privilege to work on. I, I just do wanna tell a small story that I met Rachel at a breakfast presentation at the New York Landmarks Conservancy um, where she handed me her business card which was bronze and very heavy. And she handed me, I said, oh, this is a bit heavy. And I started to hand it back to her. And then I looked at it and said, oh, it's incredibly beautiful. <laughs> I will keep it. And it's, it started uh, Lee Saltzman Architects working with Spirit Ironworks, for which I am endlessly appreciative. So thank you. Right. Uh Thank you so much. Um, I think we're, we're I, I, want, I want to thank Rachel and Tim and David and Judith. I'll say a few more wor words at the end of the lecture, but now um, we will start uh, the Q&A. And as I did mention at the beginning, we may not be able to answer everyone's question, but we, uh, we'll do our best in the 10 or 15 minutes we have left. So I'm going to start with the first question we were asked, and this is from Abby Heller. When the wealthy merchant families lived in these buildings, was the cast iron designed to reflect the family names, for instance, crests, and or the industries in which they worked? 
We're, we're certainly not aware of any specific um, relationship to that. I mean, the, the history is is limited in, in what background we have on this, but I, I could not speak to any direct relationship to that. The, the only um, real scholarship that I'm aware of, of, of ironwork from this time period is a book called uh, the, what, the Ironwork of Old Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, and they don't really talk so much about um, family connections, but they do talk about some of the uh, the meaning of the symbols, uh, such as the pineapple finial uh, on the newel post being a symbol of hospitality. Um, you know, some of the, the things like scroll works date back to class. The scroll work dates back to classical Greece. Greece. Um, so I would recommend, if you're interested, uh, take a look at that book called uh, Old, Old Philadelphia Ironwork, I believe or something along those lines. It's really reflective of the time period that this ironwork was made, although it's not, you know, the ironwork is obviously in New York City, but it's reflective of that time this, period. This, this time period is important. Right. Um, Kenneth Sisk asks, did you ever use 3D, 3D laser scan for measurements or for fabrication? No, this was actually done old school with a tape measure, a piece of paper. In, in some cases, I was also using uh, calipers and dividers, uh, not even relying on, uh, you know, measuring units, just direct comparison from one part to another, which would have been uh, consistent with how a lot of the work was done at the time. It just, it just works better when you're dealing with hot metal. You got to move fast and you can't think about numbers. Not that 3D scanning isn't a very valuable um, resource, but we did not use that for this project. Uh, this is a, a, another question. Um, could you talk a bit more about how you prepared the old iron and stripped the paint and how difficult that was? So we have an outside vendor that actually strips the paint for us. Um, but after it was done, obviously, when you take apart the metalwork, there's oftentimes lead paint between the, the pieces. So then you have to go back and remove that as well. So that becomes very labor intensive. But I leave it to a qualified vendor to remove the lead paint. That was something that um, we did not involve ourselves with. There are also many layers of paint uh, obscuring uh, the detail. And that's common with a lot of ironwork around New York City. Uh, there, are, there are some treasures on the streets of New York City under seven, eight coats of paint. You wouldn't know it. And obviously the finish that we used was a high quality two-part urethane. It is no longer lead paint, <laughs> as, as we are not allowed to use that now, although it was very effective in its time. Uh, this is another question from Abby Heller. Was the pineapple finale widely used during this period as a symbol to welcome visitors, a sign of hospitality? Yeah, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, Daniel Bianco wonders, can the castings be used for other projects? I suppose they could. The um, pattern is still available for use, yes. So all is, all is what's needed is to, um, to take the pattern, create the mold, and pour more. Um, this, I think, is going to be our, um, well, actually, we've got, our, we've got, two, we've got two, two more questions, and then I think this will be our final questions for, uh, for the evening. Um, Jerome Katz asks, Seeing the extensive ironwork restoration, are there any plans to restore the building facade, i.e. removing the window, air conditioners, replacing them with something less obtrusive? Um, so um, there was actually a significant restoration of the buildings before the ironwork. So we were brought in um, by Henry Street in 2013 to assist in establishing a restoration scope of work for the exterior and a grant from the State Historic Preservation Office was used both for the exterior restoration and 
um, staircases and hallways on the interior. So this is an, another case where some of the funding came from the state um, for the restoration. We have looked into the um, removal of the window air conditioning um, units, and, but this requires a really substantial HVAC program throughout the building, and it was something that was beyond the scope of this project. Um, but the the you know the buildings were were cleaned. The um, they, there was a substantial amount of um, of uh, masonry restoration. The work was performed by West New York. Yeah, I can just add very quickly that every brick um, has been repointed. Every piece of uh, architectural woodwork uh, has been restored, stripped down and restored. The restoration you see here to our headquarters was part of a larger capital campaign, which includes also the acquisition and restoration of the firehouse, which is really the fourth building in our continuous service uh, build, um, of our headquarters. And so um, I look forward to capital campaign 2.0 uh, <laughs> to address the rest of the details. And I'm sure we'll be convening with uh, the extraordinary partners that are around the call to help make that happen. I just hope it happens under my tenure as well. <laughs> I'm profoundly grateful to be part of this. Thanks. Yeah, and I should add that if you look at the the um, federal doorway, that was in very poor condition, and the leading was brought back, the paint was stripped, uh, the, the all the woodwork was brought back. Um, there were many other and significant areas on the lesser facades, which were also quite deteriorated. So it really was a, a substantial scope of work done. Um, so I'm, um, I'm just going to conclude. There's a couple of comments from the, or, uh, the audience. Um, uh, Abby Heller writes again, did you know that Lillian Wall lived and worked at Henry Street? She was a visionary social advocate who was a founder of the Visiting Nurse Service. That seems to dovetail very well with uh, Henry Street Settlement's uh, mission, absolutely. And finally, um, this is actually a comment um, from uh, one of Judah's colleagues, uh, 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 Inda Sessner. We at Lee Salzman Architects so enjoyed working with Spirit Ironworks. The collaboration was a delight. The ironwork restoration was the culmination of the restoration project. One thought that actually moved me as the work moved forward is that when the paint was removed and the team at Spear and Ironworks began to handle the pieces, it occurred to me that the last time the raw material components were actually touched by a human hand was 150 years ago when they were first created. Um, and finally, I'm just going to get <laughs> like a, another comment from the audience. Misha Hander wants to thank you all for this fantastic presentation. I can only echo her words. Thank you for sharing this extremely beautiful and attentive restoration project with us. Very uplifting. And I want to, again, I want to express our appreciation. Um, this presentation, I know, uh, was a tremendous amount of work. It perhaps didn't take a thousand hours, but um, it's still nonetheless, and, and uh, you know, Rachel's, um, you know, uh, dedication uh, to this presentation. As I said, you know, seven months ago, this was, lecture was going to take place. I want to express so much our appreciation to both Rachel and Tim and all the artisans connected yes. uh, with Spirit Ironworks. Yes. Um, and I know Victor, I want to also introduce you now to uh, Victoria Dangle, our executive director, who I think would also like to say a few words. Yes, and I, I thank you so much to, to Rachel and to, and to Timothy. Uh, we will never look, of course, at ironwork in the same way again. And I have to say it's so appropriate when it comes to a loving re restoration, how appropriate for a brother and sister, you know, that you are working together. It is so lovely. Uh, Judith, I received the same business card and was quite taken with it as well. <laughs> I, have to say, I do associate um, the Millers with, the, with, with their business card. But, and, I, and your work is exquisite, Rachel and Tim. But I also want to say that I, it is noted that they are frequent attendees at our lectures and feeding their souls. Not only, uh, you know, do they are in support of their own work, but their fellow artisans, I have to say, they do turn up at a number of lectures and it's, it's not unnoticed. So thank you, 
to Rachel and Tim for supporting the subject of artisanship and promoting the work of artisans. And I wanted to say to David, you know, thank you for the wonderful work that you do at the Henry Street Settlement. And, um, and just to close in saying that we were founded in 1785 by a blacksmith, uh, Robert Boyd, who uh, asked 22 fellow artisans to assemble at the Walter Iris Tavern on Pine Street. And here, 235 years later, we are still going, thank God, we're still going strong. So <laughs> to good day ahead for everyone. So thank you. And thank you to our, to our attendees who support our lectures, our constituency. We're always so grateful. Thank you. Absolutely. We, we are so delighted that you could all be yes. here with us thank you. this evening. Um, again, just, uh, just to thank Rachel and, and Tim for such a fantastic uh, yes. lecture and talk. And it, it was just a, a, such a pleasure to see your stunning work. Um, I also want to express our appreciation again to Judith Saltzman. It was very interesting to hear her perspective. And of course, uh, David, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your last name there, but David Garza, um, I want to thank you for giving such a, a wonderful overview of Henry Street and its mission. And finally, I also want to express our appreciation to Lisa Easton, who has created this series. And in fact, the final lecture of the 2020 Landmark Lecture Series uh, will be next week and will be with Patrick Stacconi, um, who's a preservationist and co-author of Bricks and Brownstone, The New York Row House. And as I said, that's on next Tuesday. Again, so many thanks to our audience uh, for joining us tonight. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. And again, a million thanks to Rachel and Tim. Thank you very, very much. Thank See you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>